Our next guest is Senator James Lankford. Senator James Lankford is committed to protecting our freedom, fighting for an efficient and transparent federal government, and ensuring our nation remains a world leader. He worked toward these ideals in the U.S. House of Representatives, and as a U.S. Senator, he will remain tenaciously committed to helping our nation reach North American energy independence, getting our nation's fiscal house in order, and protecting religious freedom around the world. Before James's time in Congress, he served as director of the Falls Creek Youth Camp, the largest youth camp in the United States. After serving four years in the U.S. House of Representatives, James was elected to the U.S. Senate on November 4th, 2014, to finish the two remaining years of retiring, retiring Senator Tom Coburn. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our final speaker, Senator James Langford. Well, good morning. For everyone here, you might need to stand and stretch your legs, but you probably won't need to stretch your fingers. Uh, as I sit in the crowd, I hear the click, click, click of everyone uh, blogging and taking notes on it. And for those folks that are joining us online, uh, welcome to this ongoing part of this conversation. It's my honor to get a chance to be here, not only to stand with you, but with also with FRC and with Tony and what's happening in so many places. Uh, I, as well, have two daughters. And uh, my bride and I, my two daughters, uh, have been very, very engaged in the uh, pro-life movement. Uh, for years, uh, 22 years in ministry and working with students, we dealt with a lot of issues and uh, walked through a lot of family issues and crisis over the, over the years. But what's amazing is at the end of it is to always come back to one simple thing. Is that a child or not? If it's a child, it changes everything. And so that ongoing part of that conversation, as Tony mentioned, that, that cheerful, happy warrior part of us comes back again over and over again to this one simple question. If that's a child, then our Declaration of Independence begins with this statement about life, that that's what we're all about. If it's about our faith and how money is spent from taxpayer dollars, then our First Amendment begins with a protection of faith. So these, these critical foundational elements we come back to over and over again. Now, they may sound philosophical to some people, so we come back again to the most basic thing. Is it a child or is it not? That's a child, and it's a child worthy of protection. So let me say a couple things to you. One is thank you for what you do all the time. You work for people you will never see and never meet. And you make a big difference. What Jill said is absolutely correct. I've served over 22 years in ministry, and I have watched the transition among students. And I, I'll tell you a little bit of why, why I think some of that is. The transitions over students over the last 20-some-odd years to watch students become progressively more and more pro-life is they speak to their parents who are more, more pro-choice and the child responds back to know that they really are convinced that's a child. That did not happen because they watched more TV at night. That did not happen because they read most of the newspapers. That happened because of the work of many of you and the people that engaged them and the fact that they could actually see for the first time, often in sonograms with greater and greater detail and to see a life that's moving around in there. <coughs> I can remember, as some of you can as well, in the health class, I will never forget uh, the picture that I saw in the health class in high school that had the picture of the chicken egg and the picture of the fetus and said, here are the two that are developing. At this stage, they are the same. And for whatever reason, even as an early high schooler, I looked at that and I thought, the chicken developing in an egg and a human being are the same at that stage? And I've never forgotten looking at that picture and thinking, we're just equating that, that tissue to be thrown away. Not so anymore. The ongoing conversation's happening, and, and that voice is getting out. So I want to say thank you to, you, to that. Let me, just, let me just mention a couple things to you just as an encouragement for all of us that are fighting through this together. Here are some challenges that I would set in front of you as you begin to push uh, an, a fresh new year again. In, in, in the pro-life years, we count years based on the March for Life, right? Uh, so this begins a new year of the work again. As we begin through the, the year again, let me encourage you in a couple of ways. What you do online, continue to press for volunteers to be engaged in crisis pregnancy centers, hope pregnancy centers, whatever term your state and your region uses. Continue to encourage volunteers to be engaged in that. Continue to encourage people to be able to donate and to give. 
there are individuals that are losing traction in some of those places. They've existed now for years, and that transition is occurring in many of those clinics and many of those places that are giving free sonograms and all those folks that are standing up. Some of the original leadership that has taken it 10, 15, 20 years is now trying to hand that off. Help them. Encourage more volunteers. Encourage people that feel like I could never be like that to understand, yes, they could. God will equip them and prepare them. And the passion that that has been given to them is to be used. So encourage the next generation of volunteers to step in and to be able to lead on those face-to-face -face conversation. Encourage folks to be able to donate and to be able to get engaged in that, including donating the sonogram equipment. All of us in this room and online all know extremely well, once a person looks inside the womb and they see that child, everything changes. So for all those different Hope Pregnancy Centers and locations that are still trying to raise funds and to do that, walk alongside them. Help them in that journey. Help people look inside the womb and see what God is knitting together. And for the first time to be able to bond with someone they felt but not seen. Help them in that process. Stay involved. <clears throat> I would say to you, don't lose hope. There is much to be hopeful for. And there's a great deal that's still going on. But continue to focus in on the most basic of elements, as I mentioned before, that child. I was on a, a very uh, popular Christian uh, MSNBC program not long ago with a gentleman named Chris Matthews. <laughs> he wanted to talk about the abortion issues. So I came on his program, and it, it was another person that was on there that was tenaciously pro-abortion. And, and we talked back and forth for a while, and I smiled and continued to talk about the child and smiled and continued to talk about the child. And at the end of it... Chris Matthews said to me, you're a very articulate spokesman for your point of view. And then it was over a year before I was ever invited on another one of his programs. <laughs> and at the end of it, I had several of the staff that I work around, and it's such a tremendous group I get to serve with, that asked me about that one comment. And I kept thinking about it, to just stay focused on the importance of that child it made a difference. And even in a program that's tenaciously liberal, they can't walk away from that one key issue. Stay on target on that. Let's stay cheerful in what we do. Let's stay on focus on that. A couple other things. We continue to press in on the religious liberty issues. Don't lose track of that. Uh, in Oklahoma, there's a tiny little craft store called Hobby Lobby uh, that's based there. You might have heard of it. There's a little bit of a conversation that's happened up, uh, around the entire country based on Hobby Lobby. I know the Green family well. They're quiet hardworking family that literally started the Hobby Lobby in a little shop with dad and mom and the boys actually hand cutting out frames to start a little frame shop. And they still run their business as Hobby Lobby the same way they always have. The family still runs it. It's not a big giant public company. It's a big giant family business. But they're still running it with the same family and the same principles. And the, and the guys that were actually cutting things out now have a nicer desk, and they're inside in a desk not cutting out frames. But they're still running the company the same way. The question came up about Hobby Lobby and pressing them specifically on the religious liberty issues. Can any administration in the United States, can any in, in administration look at a company and as the owners of that company and say, I know you have a religious faith. We disagree with how you practice your faith. You will change your faith practice to ours or we'll shut your company down. Now, that was the argument with Hobby Lobby because you know well, if Hobby Lobby chose not to provide insurance at all, their fine was $2,000 a person. If they chose to provide full insurance except for the abortion patients, their fine is $36,500 per person per year which would shut down the company, and everyone knew it. So the argument was, can they force, that is the federal government, into a company for them to change their religious practice to the preferences of the administration? Thankfully, the Supreme Court stood with us. The difficult part for us is four of the nine said yes. The administration does have the ability to step in and tell a group of individuals, you can practice your faith on weekends, but you can't practice your faith during the week. So we continue to rise up. We speak out not only for the child, but we should speak out for religious liberty. And quite frankly, I would say to us, I'm a Christian. I come from a biblical worldview. But we speak out for all faiths to be able to live out their faith practice. It's vital to us 
to be able to speak out and to say, because we want our faith protected in the days ahead. A couple other things, things that you can do to help us in this. Continue to push in ways that are fresh ways to be able to articulate the message. You are going to have some great ideas. Spread them. You have illustrations. You have ideas. Some of the ideas and the statements that have been made for years, people get tired of repeating them. They've said them over and over and over again. So you're geniuses. You're creative. Go find creative new ideas. A couple of uh, months ago, I was on the floor of the House of Representatives giving a speech, and I was talking about Kermit Gosnell, the gut-wrenching abortionist who literally delivered children and then killed them. Now, after he delivered children and then killed them, he literally took them, delivered them, flipped them over, snipped the spinal cord, and moved them just a couple feet and then set the body aside. For those instances where he fully delivered a child, snipped the spinal cord, he was convicted of murder and is now in prison. But for the instances where he kept them in the same spot and killed them inside the womb, same age, same development of child, that was considered entirely appropriate. So I went to the floor of the House of Representatives, and I took a measuring device, and I said what the court said today was the difference between a life and not a life is about 36 inches. Because if Kermit Gosnell killed the child right there on the table, it's fine. But if he delivered them, turned, and killed them right here, it was murder. So the redefinition by the court was that life is not age, life is not weight, life is not size, life was distance. Move them from here to there, it's a death. I couldn't find anyone on the floor of the House of Representatives that day and there were many that were actually seated, one of those rare moments of people actually on the floor. I couldn't find anyone on the floor that could disagree with me. How can life be defined by distance? If they're there, it's not a life. If they're there, they are. 36 inches of distance doesn't make a life. Now, that's my illustration for that day. You've got a bunch. Keep advancing ideas out there, new ways to be able to articulate the message that people of all perspectives can look at and say, okay, just answer this one simple question. Why is it not a life there, and it is a life there, it's murder 36 inches, but over there, it's perfectly acceptable, do it again. Keep pushing in those ways. We need the help. Keep telling the stories. We need the help. And I would encourage you to continue encouraging people that are even 90% with us. I have to tell you, I get a chance to serve around some people that uh, many in this room would say we're pushing them farther to the right. We're pushing them and encouraging them to move farther to the right. I would tell you, I would smile at you and say, some of the people you're pushing farther to the right, take that vote, and then when they explain it, do damage to our cause. Because they don't live it and breathe it. They don't think about it all the time. And they have a difficult time articulating it after the fact. Push the people who are with us 100%. Encourage them to get out there and to be able to speak the message. But for those that are with us at 90%, bless and encourage them. Help them move. But I would encourage you not to push them to get out front because they don't always articulate in a way that helps us long term. Just an idea. I've got a couple minutes that I can take a couple of questions, and then I think we're about to close down this great conversation. So let me take a couple questions if you have them, and then we'll go from there. Yes, ma'am. By the way, the best scarf in the room. Thank you. Assuming that the, uh, the uh, measure passes in the House today, what are, you, what are your forecasts for it in the Senate? My hope would be that we would file it immediately and start the process on that. I have not heard yet from Leader McConnell on a date to assign to that. Quite frankly, we're fairly backed up right now with a lot of stuff. We've spent two and a half weeks on the Keystone Bill, uh, which is a fascinating journey on this. Uh, but I would hope we would get it filed, and I have heard from Leader McConnell. He has been talking about it. I, I, the timing isn't so much of concern to me as do you think that there's 60 votes or do you think that 60 votes are gettable and is uh, getting to 60 votes something that we could be helpful with in uh, uh, you know, psyching people up? I, in my long experience in the Senate of two and a half weeks, <laughs> I don't know where we are yet in the Senate. I know the House very, very well uh, and what we can accomplish and can't accomplish there. Uh, even things as simple as I mentioned the Keystone. A lot of folks say the Keystone's a slam dunk. The, key, the, the House doesn't even have a veto-proof majority for the Keystone. 
Uh, so it, it, it's an interesting path on some of that. I don't know where we are yet on the Senate. And on the days ahead, I'm going to try to find out. And we're doing some quick whip checks and some things just to be able to get a feel for that. Uh, but th the hope is to continue to press this issue. It's not uh, – th the president doesn't want to talk about it in the terms that we talk about because you can't defend it. Okay. We have another question? We don't. With that, I'm going to pass the microphone back over. Let me just say one more time to you, thank you for what you're doing. Keep up the great work. We need your help. Uh, as this group knows extremely well, we live in a representative republic, which means the people like me that get the opportunity to vote represent millions of people at home who are actually putting it into practice. So I promise we'll do our job, and I know that you're going to do yours. So keep up the great work. Thanks, y'all.